Hello, Chameleon Wranglers. This is Bill Strand, and I am here with a special guest. Hello, Troy. Hello. How are you doing, Bill? All right, Troy. We are going to have to get a basic rundown as to who you are. Ooh. <laughs> um, what is I'm... the Troy Goldberg that is before us? Uh, I'm just a normal dude. Uh, I just happen to really love dart frogs, and uh, I've been really loving dart frogs for about 25 years. Um, yes. But and at yeah, the end I, of this uh, uh, episode, we're going to be talking about social media. But I'm going to go ahead and give everybody a spoiler. Troy Goldberg's Tropical Garage on YouTube is an awesome channel. You go there, and you will be lost. For, uh, take, a, take a weekend off from work and uh, well the entire week off from work and just watch all those videos that's my recommendation um, but yeah uh, it's just been the dart frog's been a passion of mine tree frogs as well I've, I've kept tree frogs over the years too um, and uh, just like anybody else you know you start small and with some pretty common species and easy to acquire animals and over time, you work your way up, and well, at least that's how I did it. I don't know how they do it nowadays, but um, you know, I didn't. I didn't get into some of the rare and high end stuff till about uh, fourteen years into the hobby. Um, and I, I, I decided I was ready. But I know some people right now are just like they they jump right in. It's like okay, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm just uh, just a normal dude. Uh, okay. I don't do any of this for my my job. Um, I sell windows and siding for my okay. job, so uh, it's slow in the winter time in Ohio. So that's why I get to really indulge in the frogs during those months. Well, Troy, I got a little bit of an issue. Uh, let me okay. start with the let me set the scenario and uh, set the stage here. So I have a uh, a line of enclosures, the Chameleon Academy branded line of enclosures at uh, Custom Reptile Habitats. And the Arboreal XL is the one behind us. And because I feel strongly about uh, uh, learning bioactive and how that can help chameleon keepers, even though the chameleon doesn't necessarily interact with the bottom, just the understanding bioactive and uh, coming at the enclosure as a, uh, as a complete holistic uh, system it really benefits the chameleon. And so this line of enclosures specifically has a, a deep substrate here. And then it has this uh, forest floor viewing window so we can enjoy what's on the forest floor. Well, I went ahead and I polled my audience and said, all right, these are your options. You know, we've got chameleon, uh, emerald tree boa, uh, even crocodile skinks. But then the one that was overwhelmingly approved is the one where I had dart frogs at the bottom, a little mini chameleon in the branches, and a, a Europolitus fantasticus satanic leaf-tailed gecko crawling around in the branches. And they all have completely different uh, uh, environments that they live in. The, the fantasticus comes out at night, the, the chameleon is up in the branches during the day, and the dart frogs are at the bottom, and so they don't meet. Uh, I little bit nervous about doing a community thing because people do wrong wrong things when they're sure. told that they can do a community thing but i know chameleons inside and out i know my europlatus fantasticus inside and out and now i need to make sure i know enough about the frogs to do this effectively and so that is what you're here for yep. <laughs> so happy to help and the way we're going to do this <laughs> is uh, that that uh, enclosure back there first of all I'll give you the basics we have a a deep substrate I, I forget what is that nine inches nine inches uh, so we have a deep substrate I've got it filled with uh, bioactive soil it's terra firma from the bio dude and uh, and then let's see the uh, it is 36 inches wide 30 inches deep and then 48 inches tall. And so we've got that arboreal, arboreal stuff up there. This is all important because the lights are all up there and I need to know what needs to get down to the forest floor. So sure. uh, let's go over, let's start off with um, species. Uh, I, I know, okay, you know what? I'm going to tell you the uh, 
the parameters of what will be generally in that enclosure. And then maybe help. we can get into the spears, uh, uh, species. So the closure is going to be generally in the mid 70s. It'll be probably upper 70s, maybe 80 at the top where the lights are. But then as the, because unless I have a basking bulb, and if I do, it'll be in the corner. Uh, but just at the top, it will be in the upper 70s, perhaps 80s. But by the time it gets down to the bottom of the, the enclosure, we should be in the low 70s. Uh, That's ideal. The, uh, the humidity will be about, and this is the air humidity. I'm not talking about down in the leaf litter. Air humidity will be about 50% during the day and up to 100% at night. Okay. And then you have the leaf litter. Uh, and here's the parameters. Uh, anything in that enclosure can change based on your recommendation, especially on the forest floor. Uh, I will need to have plants and branches up top, and, and I assume that we won't have to change too much of that for the, the frogs. But the forest floor is yours. Whatever you want changed okay. on that, it will be changed. So okay. with those parameters in mind, let's talk about what species would be appropriate in an enclosure side like that and I, I guess how we say what how many yep keep in mind i'm a chameleon uh, guy so if you say only one i go with it sure um okay so you said it, in the daytime the air would be about 50 percent humidity yeah that, that would be up it could be higher it will be okay. at least 50 percent Okay. Yeah, that that, that sounds... is in the middle of the enclosure. Okay. I mean, I see the plants there. They look like they're doing really good. So um, normally if the tank's too dry, um, the plants dry out and die, and that's kind of a sign for dart frog people. i, I got to up mm -hmm. my misting schedule and up the humidity a bit. Um, so if you're going, I mean, they should be fine with, I mean, 50 seems a little low, um, but I guess if it's getting up, high at night and dropping to 50 it should still work out um i try to keep my tanks around 70 percent humidity um but it changes as well um i have ventilation you know up top and at the door and if i've got fans running it's going to be more dry um the winter time here it's so dry in the garage that i actually tape off my vents so it's really humid but um so species for for that i mean by the way let me say I can easily make it 60, 70% humidity because both the gecko and the chameleon would do just fine. They would do just fine at 80% oh. during the day. Okay. So. Yeah, I, I would try to kick it up to like in between 60 and 70. That's probably okay. perfect. Um, something I tell a lot, because it's, it's a really tricky thing for dart frogs because they are really prone to uh, bacterial infections and um fungal infections if their enclosure is too wet and too humid so a lot of people have a hard time really dialing that part in and the way i explain it to people um they're mainly on you know most most dart frogs are primarily on the forest floor they're mainly on the ground there are some that are you know more arboreal and you'll find them up in the plants up top more often but most of them are um on the they're terrestrial they're on the floor but um so if your ground is constantly wet it's too wet so the way i yep. try and tell people what you should aim for is obviously after you miss the tank or if you've got a fogger i'm not sure exactly what you're set up there with the way you're getting that humidity in there but if you are misting the tank obviously the ground should be wet after you missed it but it should dry out pretty much to if i grab some leaves um, two hours later, it should be crunchy um, until that next misting. So you do kind of want it to dry out in between, and then when you mist again, have them be, like I say, not soaked, but should be, you know, moist or damp. Um, okay. Well, just so you know, so, I, I use a combination of a mister and a fogger, and so okay. a lot of that is during the nighttime. I do the yep. misting and the fogging. There will be some, like there will be a misting right before the lights come on, and... Yep. There may be a misting during the afternoon or may not. But the yep. only reason why I bring the humidity down during the day is so the cage dries out a little bit. 
Uh, it's not for the animals. The animals would be just fine if the humidity stayed up. So it's just by just for cage okay. hygiene control. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Um, is there drainage, um, like a drainage layer uh, in your substrate be. layer? Uh, I, I'm debating putting it in. Right now I don't have drainage, but I have a drain that I can easily install. Okay. Um, and there's, there's no drainage layer, so it's just all substrate? Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, and, um, and actually, just to be honest, this is the first time I've ever, well, not this is the second time I've done that. I did a prototype enclosure like this with terra firma and an active drain, and mm-hmm. I never got anything out of that drain. It never, okay. and the, the, the substrate wasn't saturated. It was yep. all nice and healthy. And that, Good. and I'll say that's just because of the balance of misting yep. and fogging. I did most of my hydration with the fogging and the misting just was a couple of seconds just to do a, a, yep. a layer of dew and then sure. off. Yeah, I, and that's, that. I mean, that is ideal. It's, you know, Sometimes it's hard for me to to answer that question. I don't know if, because in terms of breeding, when you're breeding these animals, you want it to be, you know, times really humid. Um, but keeping them alive and happy, you know, mm-hmm. you probably, the, the, the lower humidity in that 50, 60 range is where you're not going to have this, the substrate being saturated um, is ideal. So, you know, you'll know. Um, if it smells, if that substrate smells yeah. and it's, you know, anaerobic, then, you know, it's too wet. Um, may need to get a drain in there. But, you know, you'll be able to feel that out. But, um, I mean, honestly, the, all the dart frogs I keep, like the whole rack here, I have several different species, several different genuses. Um, I keep them all the same in terms of the parameters, the temperature. I mean, there's certain frogs that do like a little – I mean, I'm talking – a degree or two warmer or they they do better and you know so those ones are up high on the rack um but there's no different lighting there's no different heating or anything they're all on the same schedule for misting um and i have you know frogs that tolerate a little cooler temperature on the ground but they're you know so dendrobates tinctorius uh leucomelis phyllobates terribilis i mean to all the way to ufaga hist- histrionica and ufaga pamilio um it's really the same parameters, but um, well, I'll say you know, the keeping one it, that I really have in mind is the Azurius uh, yep. because I love them. And, and just a note to everybody out there: I know your Platus fantasticus is from Madagascar. I know <laughs> that Procesia superciliaris, the chameleon I was going to put in there, is from Madagascar, and I know Mantellas are from Madagascar, and the Azurius is from the New World. And I know that there's people who want me to do a Mantella because just to have a Madagascar theme. And I just yep. want to apologize to everybody. I love Azurius. Uh, it, <laughs> this may be a forbidden love, but Azurius is my Juliet and I don't care. I love them too much. <laughs> anyway, back to the interview. Yes. And you should keep whatever you want to keep. Um, you know, it's everyone's prerogative how they're, you know, if they're doing a, you know, a, a cohab tank, you know, what's going to go in it. Um, you know, it's, some people are like, no, it's gotta be, you know, the plants from South America, you know, from Colombia and the frogs mm-hmm. from Colombia. It's like, it doesn't have to be. That's in your mind. There's no like laws again, no rules. Um, but, uh, yeah, Azurius would be totally fine. Um, you know, they're still one of my favorite frogs, probably the most common dart frog in the hobby all over the world. Um, not just, you know, in North America, it's everywhere there the, and for good reason i mean they're a blue bright blue yep. un, and crazy variability with the spotting and they're just they're awesome frogs so and, and, and they're, they're fairly easy to keep I mean, and they are friendly my my yep. nose when it's feeding time and it just comes oh, right yeah. up and says hello yep yep there i've got a friend who she talks to her frogs and i mean you you'll see on her video she starts talking and they whip their head around like hello it's time to eat they uh definitely have little personalities on them but um azurius you know they're um you know tinctorious i guess in general um because that's what azurius are are um 
they're not the best group frog. Uh, can be done. You know, I have mine actually in a, in a little group. I have uh, two males and a female. With the Tinctorious, um, they tend to, the females tend to be more aggressive. Um, that's now, you know, I say that and then people will text me or message me like, hey, my males are fighting. I thought they didn't fight. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> they can, any, anything can, can have, a, have an issue with one another. It's usually females are more aggressive. Um, well, they tried to but, drown one of their own. Yes. I yes. saw that once. And I was, oh, my goodness. I cannot believe you are trying to drown your cage mate. So, yes, yeah. that's usually. So there's two ways where one can perish from fighting um, or wrestling in, with dart frogs. And one is drowning, either drowning it in a bromelia, drowning it in a little pool of water. Um, or it can just be stress-related seizure, mm-hmm. um, where if they're fighting too much and that one frog is just super stressed, eventually its immune system starts to shut down, and if they're, whatever parasite load it has can take over, um, and it's not getting the proper nutrients, and you'll find it one day in the tank, and it's sprawled out, and it's completely stiff as a board, and you're like, well, okay. that, yesterday you were moving around. So, yes, that so, can happen so too. So there's no problem having one individually, and that's the only one. No, yeah, you can do that. Um, I personally think they do better in pairs with a male and a female. Um, and I think it's what's nice about having a pair as opposed to just one is they're sexually dimorphic, where females are significantly, especially with the thing, tink- like Ufaga pamilio and Ufaga histrionica, they're not sexually dimorphic. There's nothing about them. You can look at a female and be like, oh, that's a male. And... You can look at a, uh, a male and be like, no, I think that one's a female, and you'll see it call. There's, you know, that's how you can tell is one lays eggs and one calls. That's really the only way to tell. I've heard people talk about Ufaga, and they're like, oh, I think that one's a female. It's got wide hips. And you're like, all right, man. Like, no. <laughs> that, if you, that's, that's not how you sex these animals. Um, but Tinctorious, um, Females are significantly larger. Um, they're different shape overall. Their their backs are more squared, where the males more streamlined. Um, and I think that's what's nice about you know having a pair um, with the tinctorious, especially. Like I say, you can. It's it's if you had one, you don't really get to see the difference in the other um, if you didn't have two. So I, I vote two, and really, um, if you've got a male and a female. They, they really would never, I mean, they could, but um, not really stress each other out, um, especially if you don't put, they, they can still breed in there regardless, but if you're keeping that humidity around 50 to 60 or 55 to 65, um, they likely wouldn't breed. It's a little dry for them, so they likely wouldn't breed in that condition. Um, so that's even less stress on their bodies and, you know, producing eggs and fertilizing eggs and that whole ordeal. But that's not to say that they couldn't lay eggs or breed in there. Not, I don't know if that's a goal of yours, but, um, you know, if you don't have Petri dishes or egg laying sites in there. So, um, yeah, I think Azarius would be totally fine. Now I do have a question for you. Um, something to consider is what is, you know, so I just for all your listeners, uh, I know nothing about, geckos or chameleons or reptiles in general um so what is the prey item for both of those species two week crickets and that would be the next okay. question what happens if two week crickets get into this get down there with the frog yep. so it could be a problem okay. um i've fed you know eighth inch crickets uh to my tinctorious before and they don't eat them all and a couple months later i'll find a giant cricket in their enclosure mm-hmm. no problem with the frogs but we all know crickets can be because i have phyla medusa bicolor which they like mm-hmm. the biggest crickets um and if i my ventilation um if it's not stainless steel they chew holes in it um they'll chew on frogs so there's certain people I've talked to about cohabbing certain tree frogs with dart frogs. And, you know, some people are a little more um, intense about crickets and they may really hate crickets. They're like, oh, no, those frogs, you know, they're, they go dormant at night. So those crickets, if they find those frogs, they'll chew them up. It's like, okay. But 
the crickets that I found in my tanks that are fully grown. Um, I usually just collect them and I'll throw them in the bicolor tank for them to eat. But I never noticed any like lesions or bite marks or anything being chewed. So well, that, but that that's is a concern. A, that is the main concern of mine right now is yep. the crickets. And I have the option either I don't feed crickets and I just do black soldier fly larva and silkworms and other things, even even baby yep. dubia. Uh, I don't know. Yep. I don't think Dubia would have messed with a frog. Prop, likely, unlikely. And you said two weak crickets. Yeah, yeah. What what size is that? Uh, like, I think that's a, like a quarter. Is it like inch? half inch, quarter. quarter inch. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I really think it would like unlikely be a problem. Now, I will say another species that. Uh, I don't know how small that gecko is. Um, I was going to say, Philobates terribilis love to eat crickets. They're different than most dart frogs where, like Tinctorius, they'll, some of them spit Heidei fruit flies out. And they'll, they'll spit them out like it's too big. Some of mm-hmm. them eat them up like crazy. But if you put a quarter-inch cricket in that dart frog, in the Tinctorius tank, they're, they may try to eat it, but they'll spit it or they'll give up on it. Where if you put 50 quarter inch crickets in a phylobate terribilis tank they will snatch those things up um yeah I so was, that's so- a, 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 actually the mint terribilis was my next choice for here yep. and my my only reason and one reason was i don't have to worry about the uh, the crickets they'll just slap them up <laughs> the only thing that yes. was holding me back was uh, i do a lot of interviews in here and uh-huh. unless i get a female because when those males start going, <laughs> yes, I'm gonna. All right, yes. sorry, excuse me for a moment while I, the frog <laughs> yes. stops. They're they're quite noisy. Um, so yeah, that's. But like you said, crickets um, would not be a problem for them. They will eat them. So, okay. um, but yeah, I think the geckos the, would be too big. Too uh, big. If the geckos laid eggs the babies certainly could be eaten by the frog but the babies okay. wouldn't be active during the day so unless yeah. the frog can detect uh, do, does a frog uh, use anything besides sight to uh, track down prey uh i believe vibration too okay because there's times you know if a frog's facing this way and something moves behind it it'll whip around and go chase it so it wouldn't be they they have the day right so yeah i mean i don't know how big those lizards are but there's are they bigger than morning geckos yeah yeah okay yeah because there's there's a finger okay because there's there's a like a a picture somewhere of a orange terribilis that's got a morning gecko hanging out of its mouth yeah i I'd have to be careful about that i know they're starting to get big i i know the yes. uh, the gecko and the chameleon that i've chosen are too small to bother an adult azurius much less an adult terribilis yeah uh, but yeah the terribilis so yeah that would be gets a little fierce yes um but if you feed them really well <laughs> with, with crickets uh they'll be less likely to try and eat another like a lizard or something so that's something that if that was the frog you went with um but and the, you know something that's cool about the uh the phyllobates is they do well in groups um where you could have several of them but okay. again if you have males and females those males are going to be screaming <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. they make quite a bit of noise um mm-hmm. but but yeah i think i think azarius would would likely work um, if that's your number one, that is. don't see a reason really why it wouldn't work. Um, other than you would just have to watch, you know, for the crickets. If you start noticing lesions or something on them, I mean, I've I've never had that happen, and I've found, like I say, big crickets in my tinctorious tanks over the okay. years, like probably fifty to a hundred over the years, like big okay. big crickets, and. I never noticed any lesions on them or anything like that. Um, I, I really don't. I don't know. I find it hard to believe that a cricket would try to mess with them, but 
I'll keep my I, you know, I always uh, keep my eye open and, and just so everybody knows uh, what Troy and I are discussing here is what you have to go through when you think about a community tank uh, you know, if you if you ask me if you should keep different species together I'm gonna say no so I, I every time I show this back here I'm gonna have to give a disclaimer but yeah, that, that's <laughs> of course part of it <laughs> Yep. So. Yeah, it's it's how it goes. It's it's fun too. Like trying I mean it's you're trying to I guess problem problem solve and troubleshoot potential hazards that could happen in the tank. I kind of enjoy that trying to figure out what's the what's the right or I guess not the right move, but what is the what do you need to do to make this work? Um mm -hmm. and you know, ultimately a lot of planning, a lot of thinking and still you don't you you have you don't know if it's going to work. You have to try it out and keep a close eye um, and just kind of watch it and see how it goes. But you know, yeah. um, do like, you include cleanup crew in any of yours isopods, springtails? You're breaking up. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, there you go. We're back. Okay, okay. So I heard. Do you include? Do you so? Uh, this is will this will be the intention is for this to be bioactive, and so I am yep. uh, wanting to put in springtails and uh, would like uh, your insight as far as the appropriate species of isopod that would not mess okay. with an azurius. Um, I think any I've had big isopods with my tinctorius and never noticed any issues. Um, I had like giant oranges, giant orange isopods. I had. Um, canyon isopods and some of my tinctorious tank zebras. I'm not a big isopod guy, so I'm just kind of spitting okay. off some of the ones I've had before. But um, ultimately, a kind of a if you want lo least amount of risk as possible, dwarf purples or dwarf whites are the go to for dart frog enclosures. Um, you know, and springtails of any kind, you can you'll likely have multiple different species in there that you didn't even put yes, there. Yes, yes. Um, I don't even, I don't ever seed my tanks anymore, but I usually take plant clippings from other tanks and I move them to a new one and somehow, lo and behold, mm -hmm. <laughs> I get these little blue chrome springtails in there. I get giant pinks. I get whites, regular yeah. whites, and there's just, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> they just find their way there. Same with isopods. I have all kinds of different isopods in my tank that, I didn't put there, so okay. they'll, they'll likely make their way there from whatever. They're probably, you know, I'm sure you have some in there now. <laughs> okay, Troy, let's talk nutrition and you know, general nutrition as a what do you feed fruit flaw, uh, <laughs> what do you feed dart frogs, and what, how, what do you dust? Specifically, let's talk about UVB because my UVB light is way up there, and so uh, let, let's... Let's talk nutrition for these guys. Okay. Okay. So um, I feed, like actually feed the dart frogs, uh, Heidi eye fruit flies and Melanogaster wingless fruit flies. They don't hop. They don't fly. They're just wingless. Um, there's a difference. There's some Turkish gliders and there's some other, um, I guess, species of dart or of, uh, fruit fly that people use, but... I like the wingless the best for froglets and smaller species, and I like uh, Heidi the best for Tinctorius and Phyllobates and larger Ufaga. Um, but, um, yeah, so I do fruit flies exclusively. I don't feed on purpose anything else. Um, Phyllobates, I will feed crickets um, pretty regularly. Uh, you can actually feed Phyllobates just crickets, and they'll be probably better than with fruit flies. Uh, it's a lot more substantial, uh, I guess, protein and food source than fruit flies, which are basically just a exoskeleton with some vitamins on it. <laughs> um, and uh, speaking of vitamins, uh, I do use the Rapashi Calcium Plus. I dust every feeding. Um, and I don't use Rapashi Calcium Plus every feeding. Right now I'm in a rotation where I do, and it doesn't always stay that way. It switches over the over, every year. Sometimes I start using a different supplement. But um, Rapashi Calcium Plus is my main calcium feeder or, or uh, supplement, and I use Rapashi Vitamin A. 
I do that once a week. I used to do it once a month, but um, all right, that Rapashi vitamin A. What, that's two million I use per uh, per pound. I mean, that is some serious vitamin A. Yeah, uh, where and, and why do they need that? <laughs> some people actually, some people think that's not enough. Um, there's other like pure vitamin A that people use from uh, Tickman Herps. Uh, that's his name's uh, Idris Brown. Um, he sells some supplements. Uh, a couple other brands. I'm just spitballing here, but um, yeah. So vitamin A is pretty crucial for egg laying and viable eggs. So if you're not breeding, I would say do vitamin A once a month. Um, it, it does help with their eyesight as well. And um, there's a, a syndrome. Some people call it. Uh, sticky sticky tongue syndrome or short tongue syndrome where the dart frog lunges at the fly and it's opening its mouth and it's trying to feed but the tongue doesn't come out and catch the fly um so vitamin a is a is connected with that where if the frog is vitamin a deficient they usually can have that happen um a frog that's not vitamin a deficient they don't seem to run into that all right have they figured um, out how frogs get vitamin a because preformed vitamin a is not found much in insects as far as i know so i'm not exactly sure on that i'm sure that there's somebody that's more into vitamins uh like my friend nick zappa he could probably tell you okay. um or yeah i've got friends that are really into the supplements and stuff i'm just like eh, i'm just gonna do it. it's been working okay. for me um so obviously calcium is a big yeah. big thing for metabolic bone disease with everything um but i also do um a carotenoid supplement uh, i use uh naturos uh, which i get from Idris brown at tinkmanherbs.com um and i used to use that less i guess less frequent than i do currently i used to use that about once every two weeks now i'm using it almost every feeding um because i have a lot of orange frogs that um should be red <laughs> they're w red in the in the wild oh, okay so so okay. um and i've noticed so i've been doing, doing that for, for about a year yes um but also uh, healthy and viable it helps with eggs as well um and i've noticed stronger froglets as well especially with the ufaga um you know with the large obligates it's always an issue um getting all the offspring to be healthy mm -hmm. uh it's tough you know you get five that come out of the water some people have better success than me but um i may get three that live or four that live or sometimes one that lives um and it's frustrating because you don't really understand why but i can say that since i've been doing that um the naturos literally almost every feeding um I don't seem to be losing as many, and they're growing faster. Okay. The frogs are growing faster for me. Um, they're not really lagging behind in the growth department. And and I'm talking babies here, but um, adults. So, Azurius, is that something you need? No, but because they're blue. <laughs> um, but would that help? Um, could help with eggs and just overall general health if you did it once a month or once every three weeks or something like that. Um, it would, it would hurt. I'll say. Um, and the, the last vitamin I use is uh, dendro care, um, which is sort of just a multivitamin and I use that. So I, I that's why I alternate okay. between calcium and then the next day I'll do multivitamin calcium, multivitamin. And then one day of that week I'll do the uh, vitamin A. Um, so, you know, everyone has their own regimen. Some people just do calcium plus, and that's it. And they'll do that for years, and you could potentially do that with your Azurius and be completely fine. And uh, so again, it's, would they it's, just get their D3 from the calcium plus? Right, as in, do you use yes. UVB for any of your frogs? I do, but only for my large obligates. Okay. Um, there's – I've never noticed any tinks or any of my uh, dendrobat – Dendrobat, it's, I've, I've tested with UVB with them, and I've never really seen them seeking it out, where my large obligates, um, 
I had like a little bird lamp with a UVB bulb, and I'd stick it in the tank, and I've caught several large obligates. Actually, they'll walk over to that direct light and sit there and kind of bask. Um, so they were seeking it out. The other frogs I never noticed do that. So, um, And it's not a strong UVB, I think, which it's only on two hours or three hours a day for me, and uh, it's like 13%, and it's going through screen. So, Okay. Um, you know, what's nice, and it's I have an inch an inch screen that runs along the top of the tank. So, if a frog is getting too much, they can easily escape that light, which is nice. Okay. Uh, now, you said yours is forty eight inches tall. Yeah. Okay, so that UVB is unlikely There's, hitting the floor. There will be very little UVB hitting the floor, if yeah. anything. Yep. Now, yep. The question, the the follow up question to that is, do these frogs? Uh, if I, in the back, I build a little bit of a mountain, will they use it? And should I try to get them to a point where they, they may. have access to UVB? Yeah, they may. Um, if they want it, they'll go to it. Is the, is the, full, is the top, is it full screen? Uh, it, mostly screen. There's, uh, there's some, uh, some structure in here. It, it, it's got holes cut out for the various lights. Uh, the thing yep. is that most of that screen is going to be covered. There is one uh, cutout that is specifically for ventilation to where I can put a fan if I want to get more ventilation. Yep. Okay. And how long are you running the UVB? Uh, it would be 12 hours. 12 hours. Okay. So, is, I mean, like you said, it's very little is going to be penetrating all the way to the ground. Um if a frog is up there and it wants to get it, it can easily get away. Yeah, but and go if down. I'm giving Rapashi Calcium Plus, that's got a pretty good dose of vitamin D3. So they're going to be Correct. getting it through their diet. Correct. Yeah, there's actually, uh, Idris actually sells a calcium without D3 um, for people that are using UVB. Um, but I, I have not noticed any detrimental effects from. Using D with D three and UVB, I'm not noticed because the amount that the frogs are getting is so small coming through the screen and thirteen percent. It's only on three hours a day, but um, yeah, I'd say you're uh, you're you're fine. The, okay. the the problem with UVB and dart frogs is if someone's got a ten gallon tank, yeah, and they put a strong UVB up top, and that frog can't get away from it, then they can get cooked. Um, okay. Lots of animals can get cooked that way. But, yeah, yes. Um, so UVB sort of has a, a weird stigma with dart frogs. People think it's really harmful, but I think that's generally because people are keeping dart frogs. A, a lot of hobbyists that start out keep them in really small tanks, like a 12 by 12 by 18. They put a UVB on it. It's like, yeah, you're going to have some problems. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We, I think we it's have done that right, all over the place. No, it's not the sure. UVB. It's, not every, it's the cage you're keeping them in. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Precisely. So, um, yeah, I, I don't see, I don't see where there would be a, a problem. But again, you'd have to kind of watch and see. Um, but yeah, I think if you do have a mountain or a ledge or branches that go up, that you may see the frog up at the top of the tank because uh, they will climb. Azuris do climb. Um, I've never kept a Tinctorius in a forty-eight inch tall tank. I've kept them in a. 30 inch tall tank and i'd see them up at the top though um they they go all over the place you know you know okay. that that's also a funny thing uh with dart frogs you know people talk about well phyla babies i could use it i'm gonna put them in a, a 36 by 12 by 12 because they don't need height and it's like it's like well when someone says an animal is terrestrial uh in its natural habitat in the jungle I mean, that's like they say one to three meters. So <laughs> unless your tank is nine feet tall, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, they're found up that, you know, eight, nine feet in the air. So um, they will use that. Like my tank's 24 inches tall. They're mine actually only breed. Um, up, I have like a high ledge and that's the only place they breed. They won't breed on the ground. So um, if there's space, they'll use it. So I wouldn't be surprised uh, if you saw your Zerius up high in the tank. Um, okay. But yeah, if, if the light is too intense or too hot for them, luckily for them, they can 
get away and go back down to the bottom. So, All right, so what do I need to do? I'll just uh, move myself out of the way here so we can all yep. see. So what do I need to yep. do with the bottom to make it a perfect home for the Azurius frog? What it is now is uh, a layer of leaves, mainly magnolia leaves, uh, that are on the surface. I'll add on some quickly, uh, quick, quick degrading leaves <laughs> yep. as well. Yep. Uh, so I have that, and I have... Uh, plants planted. I have uh, uh, alocasia. I have a, a maiden's hair fern planted in there. Oh, and a uh, philodendron. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love my plants. So, yep. What do I need? To Honestly, do? yeah. It it looks ideal. Uh, what I'm what I'm seeing there. Um, I I I do find that the tinctorius do like uh, stuff to climb on too. Like if you had okay. some driftwood. And you you could lean it up against the background. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. They like rock too. Like you can put fake rock or real rock. Mm -hmm. um, they like that stuff. I think that helps create a more natural look. Uh, I mean, you know, people say, "Well, the dart frogs are found, and it's all leaf litter." It's like it's not true. <laughs> I've seen pictures of dart frogs in the wild, and there's rock, there's wood, there's lots of leaf litter. There's also lots of moss around where they're found. Um, people like to hate on moss for dart frogs because they say that's not where they live, but there's many, many pictures of dart frogs in the wild on moss. So whether that frog was placed on the moss by the photographer, I don't know, but yeah. I have talked to quite a few people that have seen dart frogs in the wild and they've seen them by moss. So, um, All right. What will my yeah, little guy are, need as far as to drink? Does he need a bowl? Nothing. Nope. No bowl. Nope. No bull. Nope. I have uh, the majority of my dart frog, my tinctorious tanks have no water, no water bowl. Now, you could add uh, a bromeliad okay. um, if the tank was too dry uh, or you were worried about the tank potentially being too dry for them. Uh, a bromeliad is a place where there's little pools of water. They can go to that. They'll soak in there. Now, do um, frogs enjoy uh, having a soak? In terms of just keeping, I don't know. Um, it's it's hard to say. Uh, normally, if you see a frog constantly in the water, there's an issue. Usually, it's it's got a fungal infection or a bacterial infection, and it's trying to go to the water all the time. That's actually one of the ways to to know if a dart frog has chytrid. If you see a dart frog that is not leaving the water day after day after day, and it's always in the water. Uh, that's one of the telltale signs that it could have chytrid. Um, so to answer your question, no. Uh, now, if you're breeding dart frogs, they do soak. But you'll see the, the female soak, and then she'll go lay eggs. And while she's laying eggs, the male soaks. And then she lays the eggs, gets out of the, the Petri dish or the hut, and the male will go in and fertilize the eggs. So um, breeding tinctorious, uh, a, a water dish or a water bowl is... You don't need it, but it definitely helps with with producing some good eggs. But um, yeah, you you don't you don't need a, a water bowl or a water dish. Okay. Now, yep. I had an Azurius that would love to go poop in his water dish, so he'd always go to his water dish and poop, and then that would be what he'd use his water dish for. Is that a normal thing, or is that an indication of a problem? I don't think that's an indication of a problem, no. Um, it may just be soaking and, I don't know, to get everything moving in there. Or it may be using the water to sort of balance its, uh, I guess, everything going on inside the frog. Um, but, yeah, it's hard to say. Um, you know, now if you put a, a shallow water dish in there, not going to hurt anything, you know. Uh, you know, now if you had... Uh, a water dish that was seven inches deep and <laughs> seven inch, you know, it could be an issue. It could drown because they don't have webbed feet, so they don't swim well. Um, well, if I put any but, any dish in there, it's going to be a cricket swimming pool where they go to die. There you go. They can use, <laughs> yeah, they can they can definitely use that, um, but not not uh, a necessity. For, for where do they sleep? Huh. <sighs> um. 
I don't even know. <laughs> Mine uh, depends on the species, but usually Tinctorius, they seem to retreat to the coconut huts or a hide of some sort. Um, and they come back out. They uh, In the morning when the lights come on, you'll see them shed their skin. Okay. And it's kind of a weird, gross thing you see, but their skin sort of comes off their body and goes in their mouth. They just shed their skin into their mouth. It's kind of bizarre, but... Um, some people like have messaged me like, ah, what's wrong with my frog? <laughs> like that's okay. just, just shedding the skin. It's okay. Um, but a lot of Ufaga and, uh, other dart frogs, they'll sort of go in the leaves and roost at night. Uh, I'll go sometimes come in here at night, check on the tree frogs and I'll look around the tanks and you just see the dart frog sitting right out in the middle, sitting on a big leaf or a bromeliad leaf. But, uh, most tanks do retreat to, Wherever they go. Some frogs, I know they're hiding spots um, for having a reason to go in and collect them for some reason. But uh, other frogs, I still don't know where they hide at night or where they go. But uh, it's with the Tinctorius. Okay. But, yep. All right. So say, and now I'm speaking for uh, the chameleon community. We all, uh, we all love our chameleons. But we said we need a dart frog. In fact, I'd say if you have a live-bearing chameleon, you're always in danger of having surprise babies. You should always be making fruit flies. And the perfect way to justify doing that is by having a dart frog. So I recommend that every chameleon keeper have a dart frog. So <laughs> if we were going out to find a dart frog, are there any hints or tips that a person going out and looking for one for the first time wouldn't know? So you're saying to purchase? Yep, I want to go get an Azurius. Do I just go out and get an Azurius? Is that, are all the Azurius the same, or what, what do we have to No, have? no, they're definitely not. Um, okay. There's, you know, there's your standard-looking Azurius that they're really heavily spotted, and uh, they're, some are fine-spotted. They're sort of variable. Um, and then there's other ones, like I have the fine-spot variant, which is... Not a different locale as far as we know. It's just lime bread and trait bread that way. Um, but I really like that that look, so that's the way I went. And that's what I my froglets are like that too. Um, where if you have like a regular Azurius and, if, and you cross it or you breed it with a fine spot Azurius, uh, you may get some that are fine spot. You may get some heavy spot. Same goes for if you have two heavy spotted Azurius and you breed them, you may get you may get some fine spot and you may get some heavy spot. Uh, but I guess what you want to look for uh, is because Azurius are so popular, you don't just want to just go buy them from anybody um, because the bloodline could be you know sort of bottlenecked where you're going to get some deformities or um, just neurological issues with some that are so far down the line because uh, they're they're you know, there was only so many that came in from the wild, so they're bred back to brother, sister, grandfather, grandmother, you know, all that stuff down the line. So um, it's good to find somebody, a breeder that's reputable, um, that's been doing it for a while, and knows the species. Um, and I guess... They know how to how to raise them because Tinctorius, while they are a simple frog to keep, um, froglets can be pretty tricky. They go through this like lanky phase, and uh, you got to make sure they're getting there. If someone's just breeding frogs and feeding the froglets uh, undusted food, mm -hmm. it's a good chance you can go get an Azurius and it's got rubber rubber wrist is what we call it where it's MBD and the wrist is all uh, okay. bent and not straight or they can have shoulder issues or spine issues. So, um, that's something to look for. You do want to look for somebody reputable that's been breeding them for a while and kind of knows what they're doing. But, uh, in terms of if it's someone, you know, that's been breeding them for a while and you ask them, Hey, you got any of your available? There's really nothing to look for besides those things like, metabolic bone disease or uh, I guess fungal issues and stuff like that. You can usually tell too. If, if they've got a nose rub or something like that or rubs on their back, you obviously don't want to pick that up. But um, yeah, if it's 
a healthy looking healthy looking Azarius frog. They're pretty. They're a hardy species, so you should be okay um, with those All things right. in mind. Now, putting myself in the position of getting my first dart frog. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but there are so many awesome species and variants of dart frogs that it's really hard to just take one. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. let's go ahead and answer the obvious question. Can you put a, a Nazurius in with an Aratus? Can you have a community of dart frogs? Can you? Sure. Uh-huh. We you can, can go with should. We're looking for the best <laughs> husbandry you? here. I would say, no, you shouldn't. Okay. Um, now, not in terms of uh, the health of the frog or anything. Like if you had... If you had a male Azurius and a female Aratus in a tank, there's not they'll probably breed and you'll crossbreed those frogs and you'll get some what people call Frankenstein frogs. Um which is to each you know, everyone to each their own, uh, in terms of what they want to keep and how they want to keep. But um generally that's a bad idea, um because these frogs aren't imported anymore. Azurius, I don't know the last time Azurius were imported. Maybe the 90s. Um, it's been a long time. So um, all you're doing is potentially muddying the bloodlines and the genetics of that frog. And dart frogs breed relatively easy. So not to say that you're irresponsible, but say you had some breeding happen and you were stuck with 50 of these Azuratus babies. <laughs> and what do you do now? You don't have room for them. So you give them to people or you give them to friends. And what happens when they get them breeding? You know, it can kind of yeah. domino effect from there. Uh, so it's, it's you know, when, like I say, when people ask, can I? I always say, sure, you can. But should you is the different question. Is the question you should be asking. And my personal opinion is, is you should not. Um, now, if you now, have if males or females and so there's no breeding, is there any yep. interspecies or extra species? I don't know what the word is. Are, are the species going to fight? No, they shouldn't. Um, they could, but they shouldn't without a male present or without a female present, um, you know, vice versa. But um, they shouldn't fight, but they can. Anything. I mean, I still have, I have frogs that are male and female and they fight uh, for whatever reason. Uh, I think with the Ufaga, if if a neighboring tank has a male calling, sometimes the male thinks the female <laughs> is the one calling, and it okay. runs. And you're like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> yeah. uh, and then she'll fight back, and you're like, "Oh, this is I got to separate you guys." Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of like, I, I do see people on social media where someone posts, you know, I've got. Citronella and Azurius and Green Sips and Leucomelis and Aratus all in this tank and they post it on Facebook and it's an army of dart frog people coming and yelling at this person and while I agree that it's not what they should do um, I don't think that's the right way to go about it. You can scare people away from the hobby and ultimately we're here to kind of educate new people in the hobby and kind of show them the, the way to do it. You don't have to yell at them and tell them they're stupid and they need to mm-hmm off themselves um i i don't agree with that tra- that people being like that but um in terms of health the only thing i can say is that the more animals you have so if you had three azarius females and you had three aratus females it's just more stress mm-hmm. um okay. you know so which but again it's not really the the Aratus and Azurius thing that's causing the stress. If you had six female Azurius, it's more stress. It's just the amount of animals that's in there that can okay. cause stress. Um, that can lead to immune system shutting down and parasite load taking over and frogs ultimately yeah. becoming sick and we dying. Are well, so, well acquainted with that. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, I just generally... Sorry, my dog is scratching at the door. Um, we, are, we welcome all animals on this podcast. <laughs> He's, I can't have him in here right now because he'll probably knock some stuff over. He's a 100-pound Doberman, so I, and he's still young. 
he's not even two years old so he's a little crazy but um yeah uh you know it's it's always a difficult question when people ask about that you know can i have different fronts like sure but just i wouldn't i would keep it to to one you know well, i am very uh, happy with my single azurius okay yep. maybe i'll consider getting him a friend i would do a pair all right i would do a pair all right well then i'll talk to you and we'll figure out <laughs> what sex i have there you go <laughs> i can yeah i'm um, I consider myself an expert in terms of uh, determining sex of Tinctorius. I've been doing it for a long time, so I tell people all the time, if you've got something you're not sure of, and it's as long as it's of age, um, which I say 10 to 12 months, as long as it's 10 to 12 months old, I should be able to determine the sex of it. Yeah. Um, then so the challenge is others, finding but, someone who has a uh, an old enough to be sexed Azurius available for me to uh, get a hold of. Those are hard to find. We yeah. can find you one of those. Yeah, they're they're. I've got a lot of a lot of friends that I'm sure I could okay. message and find one for. All right, all right. So, yep. For, yeah, that's perfect. no issue for me. Yep. All right, Troy. Is there anything that I didn't ask that I should have asked to get me set to do this? Um, the tank is escape proof. Correct. Correct. Okay. There's no gaps up top or anything. They can get through some small, small little cracks, and as long as it's sealed up well, because that's I would say probably the number one cause of dart frog uh, deaths are escapees. Because once they escape, it's definitely yeah, too dry yeah. for them. So the they dry only up we have a gap, a small gap between the sliding doors, but we're how gonna... big is that gap? Uh, it's well I can hardly get my pinky in um, let's see I don't have a ruler here but uh, we're, we're having about a, an eighth of an inch um, yeah maybe give me a second Thing is, we've got a uh, an attachment coming that will just totally close that up. So I'm not going to. Oh, it. okay. Uh, just for conversation's sake, yeah, an eighth of an inch. Okay. Of an inch. Yeah, that's that's like my my doors are about an eighth inch gap too between and that some for the smaller frogs sometimes I make like a little silicone bead that co that covers up that uh that gap, but Tinctorius. They're not sliding through that small of a gap, but um, you know sometimes people drill holes for misting or for fans or stuff up top, and <laughs> yeah, I've seen some horror yeah. stories with that. <laughs> found that my all frog is, in a fan. It's <laughs> yeah, that that all is covered up with uh, fly uh, the fly screen, so the, the, the uh, very very fine fly screen, and even the fogger hole has the uh, the screen, yep. so you can't get up into the fogger too. Yeah. So, I mean, I, th okay. I looking at the tank, like if if I didn't know there were a, there was a chameleon and a lizard going in there, I would think that's a dart frog tank. It looks like a dart frog tank to me. Excellent. Um, which is which is a compliment because we'll most most um, I'll say not all, but the majority of uh, tanks that house reptiles uh, usually yeah. are not the prettiest. So. Uh, dart frog, most, most, and I talked to quite a few reptile people and they're always like the dart frog people, man, they got it down with the tanks and mm -hmm. make them look so good. So, uh, if being that that looks like a dart frog tank, that's a, well, that's, a, that's quite a compliment. And I started a caging company in 2013 and I invented dragon ledges to allow us to put plants up, up top. So we have a floating yep. garden style. And yep. from the beginning, my inspiration was the dart frog community. I said, okay, we may not be able to make exactly that, but I want us to get close. We, we need to be able to yeah. create beautiful enclosures, not only for them, but for us. And uh, so, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah That's we're, awesome. we're following, <laughs> following you closely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I think that the tank looks great. Uh, it seems ideal. Um, now... You have a misting system, or is it? Are you using just a hand mister? A misting system. There'll be a misting. Okay. Yep. And are you using like uh, reverse osmosis or distilled yes. water, or what kind of water? Water. Okay. 
in the Mist King and yep. in the Fogger. Yep. yep, I'd say I'd say you're you're good. One thing um, didn't talk about, but I didn't. I do know that a lot of all dart frogs um, s- seem to benefit from clay substrate. Okay. Um, there is it's called it's the calcium bearing clay, okay. and some people actually use they'll put a whole layer of it which I think is kind of silly because it gets really heavy. Um, I just put a little, like a little Petri dish and I, I fill it with the, the clay and I water it down and make it into like a, just a clay puck basically, if mm-hmm. you will. Uh, and you'll see the frogs, they, they're known to in the wild, they seek out clay as well. And they're, they have a pelvic patch that they actually soak up nutrients through there. Um, and so they, it's, theory that um that calcium bearing clay in the wild and that we use in the hobby is really beneficial for them in terms of certain ions and elements and nutrients that they're able to absorb through that pelvic patch so which product is this um so it's not a brand name but uh, i get it from mike rizzo at glassbox tropicals he sells it Uh, there's a few other people that sell it I believe it's sort of like the same stuff. Have you seen the springtails on clay? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, I don't know if it's the same exact recipe for that clay, but uh, I'm pretty sure that's that's okay. clay, that's uh, calcium clay. But um, yeah, you could even, if it is, like I said, I'm not sure on that, but if it is the same, then you could just take a springtail culture that's on clay and just so plop it in your So if I go around and ask for dart frog clay, people will know what I'm talking about? Uh depends on where you're at <laughs> if you're at pet smart no, no, no. <laughs> if you're at a a show uh a big show people should know or if you're on social media a lot of people will well, know the dart front i'll hobby. go to glass box There's, tropicals and uh, see what i can find there that's that yes yeah you can just type okay. in clay clay and it should pop up it's a little uh i don't have an example with me right now but um they're like these little uh almost looks like little Cheese grating, like little pieces of cheese, but they're All right. they're gray gray in color. But um, beneficial, I would say, um, if you're ever worried about or in a big tank like that, that's something that people worry about is because you dust the flies, and the second you put the flies in the tank, they start shaking that dust off. So, um, but with tinctorious, it's usually not as big of an issue because they are such big eaters that the second those flies go in there, they're huh? snatching them up. So. Uh, but that would be something I would say just anybody talking to me about dart frogs I would say is beneficial for sure. Um, I actually don't even use substrate uh, in my tanks anymore. I use a, a sponge sponge filter, Matt. Okay. And, um, yeah, it's the substrate's not needed for the dart frogs or the plants in terms of what I, this, the type of plants I use. So um, that's what I use, but that's a whole, a whole other topic. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, with your situation you got there, um, yeah, I'd, I'd throw a little a little puck of clay in there, and okay. I bet you'll see the frogs using it. There's there's some funny pictures online of frogs that are like, it looks like they dove into a pool filled with clay, and they're just <laughs> covered in it. They, they okay. love the stuff, so yeah, they love it. So all right, this sounds very exciting, and uh, I will keep Absolutely. you informed as to how this comes together. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited for you. And uh, anytime, if you have any questions, you know, you can always reach out to me and I'll be, I'll be happy to help. All right, Troy. Thank you very much. And uh, I will keep you updated. <laughs>